Hello, good morning. Okay, uh, so I would like to talk to you guys about uh, some idea of mine. I, uh, I've been uh, uh, mostly thinking about for some years now, for some time now, and uh, this is just something for me. It's uh, pretty obvious that this is a good way to go, but uh, I would love to discuss this with you guys and uh, hear what you think and maybe uh, you have some insights. But uh, uh, So I work in cybersecurity. My company is a security vendor and uh, I think there is still some uh, stuff that the whole cybersecurity industry is missing. And uh, uh, let me start from like uh, going through uh, what I call, let's say, uh, cybersecurity maturity stages. So uh, let's say stage zero was when the internet uh, came to be. Everyone was trusting everyone else because uh, why someone would uh, want to hurt anyone else on the internet? So basically, uh, we just trust everyone. So uh, this means that we had protocols like Telnet, FTP, SMTP, no encryption, uh, some basic authentication, but of course there is no encryption, so uh, it was mostly for show, I guess. <coughs> so the stage one was uh, defending from the threats from the outside. So we started to build firewalls, VPNs, uh, proper authentication systems, anti-malware solutions, anti-viruses, and stuff like that, and st stuff like this. So the focus was that uh, we can still trust people we, we work with uh, within our organization, but we do not trust uh, the internet, let's say. Uh, okay, so stage two was uh, figuring out that uh, the larger organization is, uh, the harder it is to actually uh, make sure that the organization itself is secure from the inside. So uh, my company actually started with authentication system, <coughs> but then we built a product uh, that uh, defends against threats from the inside, which monitors like privileged users. Because of course, uh, uh, oftentimes you have small IT team or multiple IT teams that have access to all companies' resources, and uh, okay, you can trust them, but of course, uh, there is no security where there is trust. So you either trust or you can verify and, uh, and properly secure your uh, perimeter, let's say. Uh, so this is stage two. So, like, uh, so we have solutions like privilege access management, data leak preventions, authorization systems, etc. So the uh, third stage, uh, and uh, those are threats related to supply chain uh, attacks, let's say. So uh, every l large or medium organization have a lot of vendors that are accessing their network. And because they have to support their own systems that you use, or uh, also organizations use a lot of third-party software or third-party products. And uh, again, we have trust here, trust issues again here, where uh, you have to trust your vendor. You have to trust that, okay, the product is secure, uh, that when you deploy especially cybersecurity product, you actually improve your security posture and not actually make it worse because the product itself is buggy, there is a, uh, a lot of vulnerabilities, so you think you're uh, making your network more secure, but actually uh, you can degrade your uh, security. Uh, and nowadays, you mostly what you can do is to simply fall back to trust or maybe do some pen testing, but those are mostly like black box pen testing, so you cannot really see inside the product and see uh, what kind of effort the vendor is putting to keep the product secure. So in my opinion, we are here. We are at stage three. <laughs> I'm not saying that 
the previous stages are solved problems, but uh, I think that more and more people are actually seeing that the supply chain is, is a real attack vector. And uh, if you even look at the uh, situation with uh, XZ, if you uh, remember the recent story uh, about uh, backdooring XZ and backdooring in uh, uh, actually OpenSSH this way. So uh, there is a, like a huge potential for like attack surface. If this wasn't discovered and XZ was deployed this is mostly related to Linux. We will have like a uh, hundred thousands of servers or millions of servers uh, uh, accessible by someone who knows who. Uh, and uh, that would be, uh, of course, disaster. So I think we need, we need, uh, uh, we need transparency. Uh <coughs> okay. Uh, Another problem with not being transparent is that if the product is built in the given country and the organization is uh, have some scale, uh, it's pretty big, the question is why the security agencies of this specific country shouldn't ask the vendor to plant some small backdoor in the product. Uh, and especially in, in US case, there's a huge potential because there is a huge number of products uh, coming from US. So why NSA shouldn't be able to ask vendors to plant a backdoor? And uh, oftentimes they can just ask, I guess. Uh, I think that Bruce Schneier was talking about this. They can just come to the vendor and just ask for a small backdoor. But there is also, uh, uh, I think that law can help with this. I think in US, uh, it is possible for ag for security agency to come to the vendor, ask to plant a backdoor or to give the logs or whatever and not uh, disclose this situation. So what I heard what uh, Cloudflare does, they PGP sign uh, this document every day that nobody asks us about the logs yet or something along the lines. So uh, uh, if there is uh, no PGP signed document at some point, then we have our answer. But this is uh, uh, this goes according to the law, uh, but we have to do hacks like this to, uh, to tell our customers that uh, our product is secure uh, in this manner. And of course, this is uh, this is huge for uh, this huge argument for open source uh, products and, and projects. So uh, uh, I think that's that's a good path. Again, okay, so uh, you may ask, why not to trust? <coughs> so as I said, agencies can force organization to put back doors. They can ask nicely, but they also can force them. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of people issues, right? People can be criminals, people can be bribed, blackmailed, incompetent. Uh, and of course, uh, people can be hacked, people who developed products, and we have situations like this as well uh, in the past. And uh, I strongly believe that security vulnerabilities can live much longer in closed source software than in open source software. So yes, it is easier to find bugs in open source, uh, but this also means that the open source software can be uh, more secure faster, let's say, because it's easier to, to audit the code. Uh, and also, uh, backdoors can be tiny. And I will show you what I mean by that uh, in a minute, uh, but uh, because this is a really interesting uh, example. But uh, first, let's... Uh, try to answer the question, does the transpar transparency really work and really help? So uh, let's move out from IT for a moment. Let's consider martial arts. <laughs> uh, so for a long time, there was this notion that martial arts work. And if you can train, you can beat bigger and stronger opponent, even if you are a smaller guy like me. So, uh, 
and this promise was never tested, right? You could watch movies, kung fu movies, where people were flying around and just uh, uh, annihilating like uh, dozens of opponents, but it wasn't never tested. So what you could do is to trust your instructor that yes, my martial art works. And uh, this is how, was, how UFC was born. Uh, there was this uh, Gracie family in Brazil that started to tweak judo uh, to, uh, for it to work for smaller and weaker people. So you don't have to be strong to, to train it. In, and the martial art was, is called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So uh, they started to go around Brazil and test it. And the rule was simply, there are no rules. We record the fight and whoever wins get the rights to the recordings, right? So you can find those uh, videos uh, from back of the day uh, on YouTube and see how that worked. So this is how UFC was founded uh, by the Gracie family. And this is Hoyce Gracie who won first three or four UFCs by uh, defeating all the opponents and all of them were bigger and stronger than him. So that was, uh, the idea was to show, to actually uh, prove that this martial art works. And there were practitioners from all kinds of martial arts that were fighting Hoist and other martial arts. Uh, and uh, only by doing this transparently, by actually testing the martial art, you can, you can say if it works or not. And there is like a huge evolution of martial arts uh, starting from uh, UFC 1. And now mixed martial arts, MMA, it's a huge sport and, uh, and it's pretty obvious now that uh, there are some martial arts that work and others that don't. Uh, so uh, transparency helped here. Similar, uh, we can see this in science. Uh, science, we believe it works because you have extensive peer reviews, you have uh, you have to show how you test your uh, ideas and uh, you, you should be able to reproduce those results. Uh, so transparency also helps for science to progress. But let's get back to cybersecurity. So in cybersecurity, uh, where transparency works really well is uh, cryptography. Uh, algorithms are open, they're uh, peer reviewed uh, constantly uh, crypto analysis results are open as well and the result, result is clear. Cryptography is rarely broken. If you have like security breach, it's almost never because uh, the AES was broken or RSA was broken. You could use uh, too short key for example maybe, but mostly the problem is with implementation and not, not with algorithm itself. And uh, Currently, uh, if there is, there will be like cybersecurity vendor that claims they invented their own crypto and they are keeping their own crypto uh, closed, uh, and this what makes it more secure. There will be, uh, I hope, laughed at because this is just uh, uh, at this stage. This is uh, this is crazy. If you want to invent your own crypto, you won't be taken seriously. And I want to show you, uh, I was talking about how uh, small a backdoor can be, and I love this example, so I will show you, maybe you, you uh, have seen it uh, already, but uh, uh, so uh, in OpenSSH, uh, there was uh, a vulnerability that you can get root access with no, no authentication, and that was the, the, uh, the change that was, uh, that was fixing the bug. So we just need to change uh, greater to greater and equal. And if you look at the assembly, there is just a difference between two jump instructions. So jump less equal or jump less. And if you look closer at, at the binary, there is only one byte difference between those two binaries. And if you look even closer at the bits, <laughs> there is just a single bit difference between 
binary which can be easily exploited and you can get root access with no authentication and binary which is perfectly secure. So uh, this simple change decides if you are secure or not. Uh, another interesting example was when Intel came up with RD Rant extension to their uh, CPUs. So uh, one of the biggest problem with uh, security and in FreeBSD we had the same problem was how to generate high quality uh, random numbers at uh, uh, ideally at high, uh, high rate and especially very early in the boot process. So uh, Intel potentially solved this problem, right? They came up with uh, instruction that can generate a lot of random numbers at really high rate, so problem solved. But uh, the problem is how we can trust Intel uh, that this random number generation is, uh, is really secure. Because you can easily uh, imagine that inside the CPU, uh, each CPU have a serial number, right? So let's say NSA talk to Intel, generate this random number using our secret key which will be planted into your silicon and just hash this key with uh, CPU serial number and just, I don't know, hash them again and again. So for everyone except for NSA, this random numbers will be fully unpredictable, like ideal random numbers. Uh, but for NSA, they would be perfectly predictable. And uh, in my opinion, backdooring random number generator is like a perfect backdoor because you don't have to connect anywhere. Uh, the solution doesn't connect anywhere, but you can read all the encrypted traffic and you can break all the cryptography uh, inside the, the product. So uh, Theodore from Linux, who was maintainer of the random, uh, was arguing uh, David Johnston who uh, was designing this for Intel, that you cannot use RDRand directly. You have to always mix uh, one source of randomness with other sources of randomness. And we had this discussion uh, in FreeBSD as well. And we came to the same exact conclusion that you cannot simply take randomness from one source and just trust that this source is uh, simply unpredictable and secure. Uh, because this cannot be transparent. You cannot look inside the CPU and see if this is backdoored or not. And, and David Johnston, I'm sure he is like trustworthy guy, but he may not work for Intel for his whole life. And also he doesn't control the whole, whole manufacturing process of Intel CPUs. So he cannot actually guarantee that this won't be backdoored somewhere in the future. That's why uh, uh, we cannot simply take it for granted. Okay, so uh, what do we need to uh, to provide this transparency? So first of all, the source code has to be open. So the let's say for starters, cybersecurity products has to have to open uh, the source code. You have to have reproducible builds uh, because uh, this is. Also uh, interesting how people are missing steps in this process. So let's say you have a product and they do provide source code. On the other hand, they also provide binaries. And you have no way to verify that this source code was used to build those binaries. And binary can be backdoored and source code can, cannot be backdoored and uh, you cannot really tell. And it was uh, another interesting story was with TrueCrypt. If you remember TrueCrypt, it was uh, disk encryption, multi-platform disk encryption. It worked for uh, several operating systems. And uh, I think the, the story was that uh, somebody wanted to, to figure out who are the authors of TrueCrypt. And it wasn't easy to find. And the project somehow stopped being developed. Uh, and there was, a, I think, uh, some student that decided to see if TrueCrypt was backdoored. So he took the 
source code because Structrupt was open source. But he also took the binaries for Windows and decided I will build the TrueCrypt from those source code and will compare. So it took him like, uh, I think, a couple of months to try to find the right Windows version, right compiler version, the same headers, uh, to, re uh, to recreate the same environment. And even then, he wasn't able to build the same binaries. So then he started to compare binaries with hex editor and figure out uh, what are the reasons for those differences. So uh, the conclusion was TrueCrypt wasn't backdoored, but the problem was that it took him like two months to confirm this, right? So uh, reproducible bits are, are really important. Uh, and it's the same like uh, for, let's say, signal uh, for your uh, mobile phones. So signal is considered one of the most secure communicator. It's open source, right? You can see the source code of signal. But how do you know that this source code was, uh, was used to build binary which is installed on your iPhone? There is this missing step that uh, uh, has to be addressed somehow for this to work, for this open source to actually have any value. And we also need uh, release transparency. So the problem uh, here is that if somebody, uh, let's say we are a vendor and we have a security breach and somebody builds a release of our product and signs the release of our product with our key but doesn't publish this on our website because then we will figure out, okay, somebody built release for us. And uh, so with certificates, uh, we, uh, there was a similar problem. Your web browser has like uh, probably a couple of hundred certificate authorities that they trust. And uh, let's say you are Google. So you want google.com to only have certificates from this specific certificate authority. But any, author any certificate authority out of those uh, couple hundreds can sign google.com certificate. So you just need to break into a single certificate authority to be able to sign certificates for any domain. So how uh, industry dealt with this problem? So this is how certificate transparency was born. So now when certificate authority signs certificate, they have to publish this information in up and only publicly available log. So now the web browser can check, okay, this certificate was not only signed by this certificate authority, but it, it was also published in this uh, available for everyone uh, up and only log. So now we can, uh, uh, so, so now Google uh, can check, okay, our certificate was not signed by some random certificate authority, because if it was, it will be on the, on the list. And I think we also need something like this for releases, for any binary release, uh, because uh, we should be able to tell that this release was released by the vendor himself, or maybe it was a result of some break-in or uh, something like this. So uh, there shouldn't be like secret, unpublished releases possible. And the whole process should be uh, verifiable. So I would love for my customers uh, at some point just uh, to be clear, we did not implement this yet. I'm not sure <laughs> if this was clear, but this is, this is uh, uh, my goal. Uh, so I want for my customers to be able to take the source code, build the binaries, build our product image, and compare with what they are running. And I would like to give them tools to, do, to go through all this process so they can confirm that what they uh, see in the source code that they are running. And this is not about being able to audit the whole source code. Uh, that would be nice, of course, but uh, once you have some uh, incident, security incident, you can go back and figure out which product was responsible for this security incident. You can do like post-mortem analysis, and if you don't have source code, you won't be able to, the vendor can simply tell you, I'm not releasing my source code, or I don't have a backdoor, or 
this is the source code without a backdoor that you can inspect, but you cannot reproduce uh, the build. You cannot build the same binary because the vendor simply didn't care uh, for this. So uh, even if you don't want to audit the whole source code, I think there is huge value in being able to go back and, and verify after the fact. And still, if you have the source code, maybe you have someone who did the audit uh, um, the solution, and maybe you have like multiple organizations that audited the solution, and you can simply trust them instead of the vendor. So you can uh, diversify the trust, uh, which is better than just trusting uh, just the vendor. And this might be a little bit controversial, but I think we need to we need to have this distinction between open source versus closed source software and free software versus proprietary software. Because now, uh, oftentimes when people talk about open source, it means that it's also free to use. And I think uh, for the industry to go forward, we need to have this uh, division that I as a vendor, I would like to be able to open source my code but it doesn't mean that I would like to, uh, I would like my competitors to use the code for free. So I think this is the missing bit that uh, I would like to be able to, uh, to release the code, but only for certain purposes. And those are, uh, for this we need the right license. So I would like to release my source code using a license that allows to audit the code, that allows to report bugs uh, back to us and maybe to run the code uh, uh, to test to fuse the code whatever but not to reuse the code for free uh, we also need uh, a way to accommodate situations where there might be a module in your product that you don't want to open source let's say you have like uh, anti-spam solution and you have some algorithm that works well, but only if it's not known. So you would like this uh, algorithm to stay closed. So I think there are still ways to do that. Like with FreeBSD, you can use Capsicum to sandbox this module. And simply by proving that everything around is open and this module is closed and this module cannot communicate anywhere else, it doesn't have to be open. For example, uh, uh, if you use, uh, I forgot, uh, Collins uh, Services Starsnap, right? So for example, uh, uh, in Collins case, uh, he did Starsnap where he open source uh, the client tools, right? But the server infrastructure is not open sourced as far as I know. And you can still prove that this is secure because just by inspecting, analyzing the client code, you can figure out that the client always encrypts the data that it sends. So you can stop there because the data is already encrypted. It never leaks to the server. So it doesn't matter what happens in the infrastructure because there is zero knowledge on the infrastructure side. So Colin is not able to decrypt the data because you can uh, tell that the client itself never sends decrypted data or data encrypted with some weak key or key known to Colin or wherever. And this is how zero knowledge protocols work. This, the same works with your password managers or most password managers that just by inspecting the client, you can tell that uh, you don't really need to inspect uh, server infrastructure because the client itself is secure enough and, and the security actually ends there. So you can, uh, you don't have to open all the modules, you just have to prove that the module doesn't have to be open. Uh, did I skip the slide? Yes, I was here, sorry. Uh, so another concern is IP protection. Uh, and 
I think that the vendors use this just as an excuse not to open the software because the license and the law is there to enforce IP protections and not closing your source. So I think that this, this argument, I don't really believe in this argument that people don't want to open the source code because uh, they want to protect their IP. With uh, some exceptions, uh, but uh, mostly uh, I think that the law should protect the IP and not the, uh, closing the source code. Uh, another problem is, is this uh, big enough competitive advantage? So I think that we really need to build awareness in the industry that this is something that is valuable for the customers. Because if customers are not aware that this is huge additional value having a verifiable product, it means that your competitors can look at your product and uh, improve their product based on, on this knowledge, but you gain nothing. So uh, I think that this awareness is really important so, so the vendors would like to open, uh, would like to be transparent because this, this will be a big selling point for them. And of course the challenge is the cloud, but uh, it's interesting because this is good timing because Apple, uh, there is a link to, to Apple's document, how they do private cloud computing for iPhones. So where they have to use, uh, where they have to use models that don't fit on your iPhone and they have to go to the cloud. And there is like a really interesting design how they uh, can ensure that when your da data is sent to the cloud, it's really uh, anonymized, there are no logs, and that it's really uh, transparent and verifiable. So uh, as a security researcher, you can go and verify Apple infrastructure, which is really cool. I think this is like a, uh, a huge step in the right direction, uh, being able to do this for the cloud, because the cloud providers are hardest to, to verify, because you can verify one instance or one version of the source code, but you never know when it was upgraded, when it was changed, or whatever. <clears throat> so what are the risks? Uh, bugs can be and will be found, but I think it's for the best. Of course, if you're a vendor that is going to open source your product, then it might be this initial period where you might be overwhelmed with, with the bugs. I hope not, but uh, uh, it's all for the best. So those bugs were there in the first place. So they will be found, they will be fixed, the product will be more secure. Uh, there is a risk, and we had those risks actually uh, with our product, that for uh, markets with weaker IP protections laws, your source code can be used, your product can be uh, uh, used for free. So, uh, but I hope you can gain more uh, with this, uh, adding this selling point to the product. And hopefully some markets will mature at some point. Uh, and you get this uh, public scrutiny uh, uh, also. So, and I also think that for customers, uh, it's good for, for you as a vendor, it's more work, uh, but you have to uh, make sure that you don't have technical debt, uh, you don't have outdated third party software, etc. cetera. So uh, uh, again, all in all, I think it's for the best. And of course the source code can be used for, by competitors to better understand your product and maybe improve their product so uh, those are simply risks. Uh, but customer can gain a lot. So first of all, they know what they are paying for. They can always look, they can always verify the quality of the source code, uh, what is happening in the product, etc. So they gain full verifiability. So if something happens, they can go back, they can verify the product. The vendor is fully accountable, the vendor cannot say that we no longer have this version, uh, this uh, source code, we lost the source code or whatever, and we cannot really prove that there was no backdoor in this version. Uh, we get higher quality because I think one of the main reasons 
uh, vendors don't release the source code is that simply the uh, source code is a mess and it's, uh, it will be embarrassing to open source uh, the code. Uh, vendors can't be forced into planting a backdoor this way because the whole process is verifiable. If you have a backdoor, it will be visible. Uh, it's easier to find vulnerabilities, which means the product will be more secure. And uh, of course, there is some ideology behind that as well. Uh, so the end goal is that the vendor transparency is just a natural element of cybersecurity hygiene. So I hope that if we meet in like 10 or 20 years, or maybe later, who knows, uh, if we live that long, but uh, I hope that this will be something like obvious, like now with cryptography we have full transparency and for everyone it's obvious that you have open cryptographic algorithms and uh, and i think this is pretty important that uh, and this is pretty uh, important missing piece of this whole cybersecurity puzzle so uh, hopefully this will happen one day and uh, we are planning to uh, to try to do that at some point Okay, so uh, uh, last but not least, uh, small, <laughs> uh, quick question. Why your vendor won't open the source code? Is it because it is a mess? <laughs> it has backdoors, it doesn't, he doesn't have it, <laughs> all, of the, all of the above. Okay, that's it for me, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm open to questions. Uh, yes, Warner. So the question is about So uh, the question is about hardware vendors and uh, what to tell to them about uh, opening some uh, management software I guess or uh, Yeah so I think this is this is this is exactly the same problem as with uh, closed source products right that uh, uh, I don't think, I don't really believe in this secret sauce argument. Of course you can have something really innovative but then maybe uh, you have patent protection maybe or at least you have IP laws in place. I'm not really fan of patents on software but, uh, but I think we need this transparency. I'm not saying that this transparency is easy to achieve everywhere, especially in hardware. Uh, but, uh, but there are some uh, moves in this direction. You have risk, uh, risk five, right? Which is uh, more open. Uh, ARM is already more open than Intel and risk five is more open than ARM, etc. cetera. So uh, there is some moves in this direction. I'm not sure if we'll be able, I don't have answer to all the questions, how we can achieve like full transparency. Uh, but there is a problem. I, uh, for example, I, uh, I talked to uh, one of the, I think, uh, companies that uh, uh, simply give you dedicated servers, right? And when they change customers, they have to flush all the uh, EPROMs, like uh, for example, your right controller firmware or whatever. They have to flush all of those uh, because they have no idea what previous customers was able to put in there, right? So uh, there is a problem there as well. And, uh, and it's not actually easy because you can reflash those EPROMs only limited number of times. So, uh, but there, yeah, there is prob the same problem there as well. Brian? I have two points. Uh, the first being um, something to add to the attack is the attack on standard bodies. 
if one needed a FIPS 140 certificate for quite a while, you had to use the dual EC DRBG, which was highly believed to be backdoored. So my open source crypto, you can see it's a dual EC, but again, the attack on the standards body. Um, so that's a threat even in the face of open source. Uh, the other point is I think you're gravely underestimating the IP threat. Um, you know, ask Cisco how well that went with Huawei, who stole their operating system and got a huge head start. Now, granted, that might be a country of low IP. Take Juniper Networks v. Palo Alto Networks. A big swath of Juniper Firewall people took and started a new company, and it took so many years of litigation, even in a, a high IP, uh, well, con com sorry, country, they got so much market share while you were fighting that. So I really think even in you know, strong law areas, the IP threat's harder than you may think. Oh, the other thing is that they don't want to get sued by somebody whose uh, IP they're accidentally infringing upon. Um, so they don't take the chance and never release the source. It's another problem I've had trying to get source out of vendors. Okay, I do understand this argument, but on the other hand, you have m many examples of successful products that are open source, right? So, uh, yes, the risk is always there, but I as a customer, right, would prefer to use product that I can verify. So if you uh, start from the customer perspective, right, of course, it might be that it's, uh, the business is not there, right? Uh, but I think that uh, currently the open source model is not great for the business. If you just open source and give the code for free, that's a problem. But if you have the right license, at least you can sell on the markets with strong IP laws, right? And uh, so I don't know, I don't know. There are a lot of uh, paths that can be explored, for example, uh, let the vendor release two versions of the product. One with limited functionality, but fully transparent, and one with more features that you don't want to open yet, and see what the market is, uh, what the market prefers, right? Uh, no idea. Uh, you want the mic or? I mean, uh, yeah. Um, so the hardware stuff's challenging, but not uh, not insurmountable. I think people sometimes underestimate how much hardware is built by throwing Synopsys a crap ton of money and using their IP cores, and then that comes with you can't release anything as part of that, and so. You know, a lot, there's a lot of third-party vendor IP behind the scenes in the silicon world that gets pulled into various places um, that turns into the glue that prohibits a lot of open hardware stuff from happening. And open, vendors opening their existing hardware. You can make, vendors do make their own hardware from scratch. Um, and there are some efforts where people are actually pulling in open cores for some of the synopsis replacements because they're kind of fed up with how much that's costing. But like, don't discount how much behind the scenes stuff. I like the ASIC design just bypasses all of this by throwing money at the problem at a vendor, and then that that's the that's the first step that makes getting truly transparent hardware showing up. Um, the on the flip side, like you can actually make that. There are websites now; people are actually making open hardware. Vendors could, if they wanted to, build open hardware from scratch and get it made. I haven't seen a lot of it, but it is out there. I've seen plenty of of large companies making their own silicon leveraging that, and they're not open sourcing anything. But I certainly haven't seen anyone in the market yet do that. And if there's any way to encourage hardware vendors starting from an open slate, because Risk Five Core, that's the easy bit. That's the super easy bit. It's the PCIe controller and the SD RAM controller getting all the clock tree crap sorted out and all the power management stuff and suddenly the only thing that's open on your core is the risk 5 core and nothing else. And if we can crack that somehow, then I, the, this open transparent hardware stuff could happen and I'd love to see a market for that. I really would. 
Yeah, that's why I think that we need this awareness, right? And the pressure from the uh, from the customers that this is actually important, right? Like, I think that this it might have been like maybe a little bit of similar story with crypto, right? Somewhere at the beginning, vendors were using their own crypto, not releasing it, etc. And by uh, pressure from the customers that this is silly, right? And pressure from the industry, uh, everyone now uses just open crypto, right? So uh, I, I'm fully aware this is a long way to go, but uh, uh, that's why we need this awareness and this, this pressure, I guess. Uh, What's the license for this? You said we need a new license to protect some of it and not others. So, uh, so I don't have the license yet. Maybe you guys knew, know about license like this, but uh, I would like the license to permit auditing the code, uh, reporting the bugs back to us, but also running like a test instance. So you can use like fuzzers, et cetera, to test, like to automatically test uh, but yes, I'm not sure there is license like this. There are some licenses that are quite similar to what I'm proposing, but they are not uh, uh, like uh, they are mostly to protect the business and are not designed from like cybersecurity perspective, right? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Pavel.